What's up, everyone, and welcome to The Corporate Bartender. Today's episode is one of my favorites of all time. We're talking about politics in the workplace, promotability, assessments, and coaching, and we are elated to have Amy Bernard Bond on the show today. If you don't know Amy, you are missing out. She's incredible, so get on that. She's a former Fortune Global 50 executive, a lawyer, and leadership consultant to the stars. Amy has been recognized by Forbes as one of the top coaches for legal and compliance professionals and is the creator of the Promotability Index, a leadership assessment tool used by thousands to advance their careers. And she's just a hoot. So buckle up, TC beers, grab your favorite cocktail, and let's get right on into it with Amy Bernard Bond on today's TCB. Welcome to Sky Team's The Corporate Bartender. If you work in HR or make people decisions in your organization, this is the place to be. Now pull up a stool, belly up to the bar, and join us for The Corporate Bartender. Well, welcome. It's good to see everybody. Let's go ahead and, and dive on in. Lori, watch the door. Got make it. sure you make sure you keep the riffraff out. <laughs> and and uh, welcome. Thanks for joining today. It's Wednesday. It's my favorite day. It is Corporate Bartender Day. Here we are, episode 85, Cinco de Mayo 2021. Today's going to be a fun one. We've got a special guest today. Amy Bernard Bond is here. Say hi, Amy. Hi. Hi, <laughs> <Thanks> everybody. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's going to be a fun day. We're going to we're going to chat with Amy. We're going to do our normal top and tail stuff. We've got some headlines. We got a little twist on the headlines today. Um, we're going to talk about uh, a profile that um, Amy created and a book that's going around that, and all sorts of other fun stuff today. So, with that, let's get right on into it with um, news you can use. Today's news, we got three items here today. Um, the first one is from HBR on our recurrent theme around AI. And this is an interesting one to me. It's around um, AI regulations that are coming. It's, it's an interesting one because unlike a lot of other sort of tectonic shifts, uh, the regulation is, is coming along with it, maybe even ahead of it in some cases, uh, versus the whipsaw of trying to react to technology that has driven change. Um, I find that fascinating. So pay attention to your company and, and how it relates to AI changes. We're going to have on, on the show in a couple of weeks, um, the gal from me be bot, Beth, Beth White. From, yes, Beth. Yeah. Right. Beth White from me be bot. Um, who's built a business around using chatbots as a frontline HR resource. Um, so those folks who said AI doesn't matter in HR, it's gonna matter and it's gonna matter quicker than I think we're all ready for. So be tuned into that. Uh, the, the next couple articles here were actually authored by our guest, Amy Bernard Bond today. Um, and Amy, since you wrote them, I, I'm going to ask you to speak about them, if that's okay. Uh, let's start with the fun politics at work one from Compliance Week. Okay, great. Well, um, having served in HR myself for over a decade and, and as a former chief human resources officer, amongst other roles, including compliance, um, politics in the workplace has been around for a long time, but it really reached a, a peak point um, in the last election. And so we were seeing that this article happens to be written for compliance week because I'm also an attorney. I was an employment attorney and litigator when I started my career and then moved into HR and then moved into compliance. And I've gone back and forth between legal and HR and helping to drive culture the rest of my uh, career. And so um, I thought it'd be a good time because compliance officers actually get complaints as well. You know, we know in HR, they get complaints, but there was an incredible study by Sherm that said, uh, Gartner study actually, sorry, that said that last election in 2020, it really reached um, a watershed moment where 78% mm. of people discussed politics in the workplace, which that means a lot of people are discussing it virtually, right? right. Um, and then the one that really got me that motivated me to write the article, Eric, was that 36% of people said that the presidential election topic caused them to avoid or stop working with 
wow. a co work a coworker due to their political views. And that's one out of three. Like, can you imagine that in the workplace? That's big. Yeah. That's a, that's a heck of a lot, right? One in three. And how do you manage that, like as a leader? So I wanted to write an article that was helpful, um, both from a, a compliance and ethics and an HR standpoint, because candidly, one of the areas that I write and speak in quite frequently is how HR and compliance should really partner together because they are just, they should be hand in glove to really help support each other. And unfortunately, that's not always the case. Um, so I'm often either talking to HR audiences about how to relate to their law department and their compliance people better or vice versa, talking to HR about, hey, here's how to approach that lawyer that's really difficult to work with and doesn't get HR, right? Yeah. So. So um, yeah, I'd be curious about what people have found, but these were tips and tricks around, you know, do you have a policy um, thinking about, you know, cancel culture and are you gonna be okay if your CEO shows up on the front page of the newspaper with a, with a MAGA hat that's happened, right? Yeah. Um, we, we actually had a, a, a conversation evolving over on the Bartender Network, which is our little social network for, for folks in this community. Um, around the stuff that happened at base camp this last week mm. where, where they actually put out a, you know, no politics policy and a third of the employees quit. I, I heard about that. Yeah. Yeah. Cr crazy. Really? And you know, your, your, your 36% number there, Amy, which is a mind blowingly high number that happened in 2020 when most of us don't have to share the cafeteria or pass each other in the hallway. That's that's what's so shocking, Eric, right? So the number will would would have been worse. I guess that's a silver lining to COVID. I don't know. Um, but uh, it's not good. And so, and, you know, as I mentioned in the article, I, you know, I've got a 20 year old and a 16 year old and they believe in bringing their whole selves to work mm -hmm. and in HR. Mm -hmm. There's so much fun with that and so much opportunity. Um, <laughs> but, um, positive and negative, right? People can be authentic in theory, but they don't always draw good boundaries. Yeah. And so, so how do we help grow people up? Um, how do we not take sides? Um, that's what this article is about, is around, let's get it back uh, focused on work, not making anybody feel shut down or like you're choosing a side, but you know, we've gotta be uh, the leaders in modeling the right behaviors and how do you do that? Yeah, I, I, lo I love what you said about the generational thing. I've got, I've got twenty and seventeen in in yeah. in my oh, world. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And to your point, right? Th they see the world in a different way than than we do. We actually uh, did an episode a couple of weeks ago on social justice, and we talked about companies taking stands on issues being very different than the paradigm our parents grew up in, where companies didn't take stands on anything. You put your head down, you went to work, you did your thing. Um, but my kids, they expect companies to take stands and they will align themselves with those that, that match their interests and distance themselves from those that, that do not. Um, and the conversation that we got into was this, can we afford to not take a stand moving forward on social issues like this, politics, big social stuff? Um, and what's the downside of, of either, right? We take a stand, we're gonna alienate some people. We don't take a stand, we're gonna alienate some people internally and externally to the organization. What, what advice would you give companies facing that dilemma right now? You know, I think I, I end up where I was about 15 years ago on this when I was working on corporate social responsibility initiatives mm -hmm. and as a part of our culture driver and some work really well and some don't. I think you have to look at your brand and you have to remember who you're serving as your customer base. And if you can align your position and express it in an authentic way that isn't reactive and that makes sense, then I think you should go ahead and do that. A, a simple example, which is non-political, I believe, is I was you know, at, at Fireman's Fund and we created the Heritage program, mm -hmm. which donated money to firefighters. Mm -hmm. The reason that was so brilliant is we were an insurance, we were a PNC insurance company. And so anytime a firefighter would come and put out a fire that reduced claims. So it directly mm -hmm. related to our investors, our insureds, the and the communities that we lived and served in. Um, 
And, you know, a great example that didn't work is Ben and Jerry's when they put an anti-war oh, yeah. slogan on the ice cream. Do you remember that? People were like, I do. I'm drinking, I'm drinking Cherry Garcia. I don't want to be thinking about war and guns right now. And that totally backfired. You know, it was the founder's strong belief. And that's, of course, you know, their, their right to do that. But it didn't work from a marketing yeah. and customer standpoint. Um, I worry about the value signaling. I, I was an article you didn't put up, but which totally is a, a pay inequality article that I wrote for Harvard in October. And it was around how to identify and fix pay inequality in your company. And it was my response to all the value signaling that I was really, frankly, getting tired of crossing my email without any concrete actions around what people were actually doing. You know, don't tell me you care about this stuff. Like, show me what you're doing. Mm. Do you have your data from HR? What is your talent acquisition strategy? Um, have you checked your pay to make sure that you don't have unconscious bias that's crept in, right? So that's what I, I, that's how I would respond to, to how people, how companies should be thinking about this. And if they're not good on those things, they should probably just shut up. <laughs> I, I love everything you said. And I think you should start coming every week because we did one last week on uh, bias and performance reviews and just mm -hmm. things that we hadn't ever thought about. Sounds like you have opinions on this stuff, Amy. I, I, I don't know what gives that away. Um, I love this this other article about promotions. Um, you know, the work that we do here at Sky Team is always about relationships. We lens mm -hmm. everything uh, through the quality and depth of the relationships you have at work. Um, how is that related to promotability here in this HBR piece? Yeah, this article came out of of the Promotability Index, which is a free leadership assessment tool that I created and launched in January 2020. And it was reverse engineering promotions from my experience as a CHRO and as, as a CAO and an executive in multiple roles and doing riffs and layoffs and who gets retained, you know, and gets the retention bonuses, who, who gets let go and just really watching succession planning and how it, how it really works. Um, and trying to help people be more aware of what they need to be thinking about really at any stage in their career. I've also been very involved in the women on boards, diversity movement, testified for the first laws in the United States that changed the law and required corporate boards to um, have women on their board, which you wouldn't think we'd need a law, but um, right? apparently we did. Um, and um, it has moved the dial. See, it's the only thing that's ever moved the dial in any country in the world is having a law. Um, and wow. so, so I would say that, so backing all of that in, one of the you know key elements was around relationships. And what I started to find, Eric, in a lot of my coaching with executives and, te and their teams is that th this article is actually from HBR Ascend. It became popular in HBR as well, which actually surprised me a little bit, but um, it was geared originally towards a younger audience that, that, um, that I was seeing a trend on where you know, they work and work and work and work, and this describes your 20s and maybe part of your 30s for, for many people. You get that credential, you get that first hot job at McKinsey, whatever it is, and you're really focused on certifications and just being the best technician at your vertical of knowledge, whatever that is for you. And there comes a point in time where that's actually, I wouldn't say irrelevant, but it's not gonna get you promoted. And what's going to get you promoted is your relationships. And for a lot of, a lot of um, technical specialists, I'll call them attorneys, IT people, um, doctors, people who, who um, for whom they've been rewarded really solely on the basis of their technical expertise and their credential and their ego and their professional identity is, is around that. They forget um, that they needed to be networking, that maybe that right. peer that, that they hated and um, that they ostracized that's now their boss, maybe that wasn't a great idea. Um, <laughs> you know, stuff people leave and go to other companies, you know, and, and, and so you need to be thinking a little broader about your relationships. And so this was just kind of a, a slice of some of what I was finding from my promotability index and my coaching. So this is great. I, I did a, a training session yesterday on emotional intelligence. And one of the kind of opening context setting studies that I share was a, the longitudinal study by um, uh, of graduates of the legal medical and business mm. program mm -hmm. at Harvard, right? Wonderful. And yeah. they looked at over 30 years, what were the success factors? What were the contributors to their success? And it, it categorized IQ, 
right? What we call FQ, <laughs> functional, right? The technical and EQ. And it was like 25% IQ, like 10 to 20% functional and 55 to 65% emotional intelligence. I'd love to get a copy of that. That's so cool, Lori. That's, mm-hmm. Yeah. 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 It's all about the people skills, man. It's all about the people skills. And we know well, that. Right? Preaching preach the choir. Preaching the choir. <laughs> That's well, why we're here. Can I just add one, oh, one other slice to that, if I may? That yeah, because go ahead. I think at the surface, it almost seems like, hey, it's, it's who you know, it's not what you know, but it's the quality of the relationship, the empathy associated with it, this genuine humility and the sincere, authentic interest in others. Uh, and the success associated with them, this care. Uh, Brene Brown's most recent uh, podcast speaks to this uh, quite eloquently in which she talks about how the most successful leaders are those who have this caring sensibility that they introduce into their relationships with their team and and their peers. And and so that that would just be my qualifier. It's not just the relationship politically, right? Because people well, sure. say, oh, okay, I, I need to just make sure I know the right people here so I can, mm-hmm. um, you know, advance. But it's it's how they manage the relationships, which is For so sure. cri- critically important. For that sure. Helps, and that's in the article. It's around how do you um, how do you strengthen and build authentic relationships and and demonstrate all kinds of other skills, strategic thinking as yeah. a willingness to help others because you need to already be acting like a leader in my opinion um before before you get the privilege of leading other people I, yeah. ideally yeah you know, the emotional have- intelligence that Lori mentioned a mm-hmm. moment ago yeah thanks amy yeah thank awesome you. nice to meet you awesome. All right. Well, hey, kind of a weird twist that our guest is an author of the news items of the day, but let's flip on in to the interview. So, Amy, what makes you so qualified to write articles like this? Who are you? Tell the group a little bit about your history. And we always ask for people to include any weird or noteworthy jobs they had along the way. Who is Amy Bernard Bond? Um, Well, I'll start with the official bio and then I can tell you the fun stuff. How's that? Sounds great. I love it. Okay. All right. So the, the official bio is that I'm an executive coach and consultant and I specialize in fortune 500 executives and, and working with teams with Adobe and bank of the West, the gap, a lot of, and Chegg, some Silicon Valley companies. And I really work at the intersection of, of three areas, workplace culture, corporate governance, and leadership effectiveness. And I'm a contributor to Harvard Business Review, Fast Company, and then I've guest lectured at Stanford and UC Berkeley. I'm a fellow at the Harvard Institute of Coaching. And then um, I have a former CHRO. Um, and I've also been an executive at, at other companies like McKesson and Allianz and the California Dental Association. And then I'm a member with, of MG100 with Morag, which is so wonderful. Awesome. Um, so then the the non-bio stuff that, that most people, you know, I guess don't always publish perhaps is um, I'm a creative writing poetry major with a Mandarin minor um, who then went to law school and, and had to kind of figure it all out later. Um, hated litigation, but it was a great experience to then go into HR because I did employment discrimination for both a plaintiff and defense. So I got to see- Oh, interesting. Five. It was cool. I, I, I went to work for a non-prestigious, never heard of it kind of law firm that um, didn't, the upside to that was um, they didn't conflict out of litigation. So you could, we could do both. Um, and I realized that I loved advice and counsel. And I realized that I hated being stuck with the facts and that there were so <laughs> many boneheaded decisions that managers and people had made in terms of how they handled people on the way out how they disciplined. Um, really? <laughs> Weird. I, I know. I, just, <laughs> I know you guys get, get this, um, but, but it was, it was upsetting. I was like, why didn't they just do this? Now I'm stuck with this lawsuit and, you know, and vice versa. Sometimes um, companies didn't communicate why they were terminating someone well. And so guess what? We make up a reason, right? So for a lot of mm-hmm. people, that's well, you, you fired me because I'm old. And I had one age discrimination case I'll never forget. And it was one of the cases that made me be like, light bulb, I need to go into HR, you know? And um, this guy was convinced that it was because of his age and I, I was representing him. And so I had every reason to look for evidence that would support that claim. And there was none. And I, I literally had to have a phone call with him and just say, 
you know, they might've handled this badly and they didn't maybe help you along the way with, with your performance and where it was shortfall, but, but there's not a claim here. And that was really great education for everything I've done really ever since. Policies, investigations, training, and I've implemented global investigation systems at, at three companies, you know, and- um, You work in all the sexiest parts of <laughs> HR, compliance, legal, I oh. I mean, I, I, I've done comp and it, it's, it's fun. I mean, I, I think it's fascinating, right? How do we allocate power? How do we create structures that are fair? Um, how do we try to do the right thing? That's, that's what I'm fascinated with. And that's what kind of my work revolves around. So you've, you created this assessment last year, this promotability assessment. Yep. How did that come to be? What are the components of it? Why should we all go take it? Yeah, it'd be great to get your feedback on it. Um, I wanted to put a tool in the hands of everyone that raised awareness around things they should be thinking about if they wanted to be promoted. Um, and not everyone does. Actually, one interesting finding I've had from some of my clients that have implemented it as a part of their performance management system um, is that about a third of people don't actually want to be promoted. They're happy where they are. Um, you know, some may or may not be doing a good job. We'll leave that for my colleagues to decide. Um, you know, but but they're they're happy. And then the other two thirds are are intrigued or interested. And then I had a couple others where managers said that they had never thought about it until they took it, and it prompted the discussion, which is really great. And and frankly, more often than not, those happened with women, um, mm. which is obviously of interest to, to all of us. I think right now. Um, so I wanted to put a tool in, in the hands of people, especially. Um, I didn't know the pandemic was coming, but the timing was good because there was so much last year that we couldn't control. And so I think what attracted people to it as well, Eric, was that this is around the, the index assumes that you are in the driver's seat of your career. It's not your company's responsibility to hand you everything that you need to be actively um, in the driver's seat and to be a self-authoring person, which is are the types of clients I coach is people who want to be conscious leaders who want to be the best they can be, you know, and, and lead good teams and lead authentically. And so this breaks down into five areas, self-awareness, external awareness, which is how does your behavior impact other people? And to a point that David made earlier, right? What is the real relationship as opposed to self-awareness? Why do I do what I do? What motive, what motivates me? What kind of work environment is my preference? What's my conflict style when I'm under stress or challenged, right? And then the third element is strategic thinking, your capability around that and the degree to which others see you as a strategic thinker, which is really critical to a promotion. And as many of you, of course, know. And then the fourth is executive presence, presentation skills, gravitas, grace under pressure. Um, and then the fifth is um, thought leadership. Mm. Are you viewed, have you, um, started to develop a professional identity outside of your uh, company, which is something that becomes more and more important as you're an executive, where you're a respected thought leader in your field, and then especially sure, important sure. when you're on a corporate board or other things that you may want to do in your career. Yeah. So in terms of the audience for this, uh, this profile, who, who did you point this at when you built it? Who was it for? <laughs> I probably uh, used myself as the guinea pig, right? So, <laughs> um, but I wanted it to be, um, to anyone to be able to enter it at any point. And the intent is actually that it's iterative, which embeds my principle mm. that, that ca uh, careers aren't linear, that um, you may have um, troughs and spikes and, and that's great, but it's really more sometimes like this and, you know, an arc and then maybe a huge, hockey stick, but maybe you're flat for a while, um, you know, and we could talk about all the, the reasons for that, but I, I wanted it to, to be inspirational and motivational, something people can pick up and put down every nine months to a year. If, if people take it, there's 82 questions and it's just, you check the box or you uncheck the box. Um, and then it gives you a score. And then the things that you, that you unchecked are things you could consider working on. And it's a choose your own adventure. You know, if you, don't, if you don't feel like being a thought leader and trying to write for a fancy magazine, then that's totally fine. Maybe you've decided you should work on your self-awareness and, and where, whether you're where you want to be right now, or maybe you need to 
think about your strategic thinking. So it's a, it, it gives you an option. And um, I wanted it to be developmental, not evaluative, and to drive, mm. give, give leaders and employees a language to share, to use objective criteria for promotions. I think that so a lot of times promotions are, um, I mean, I've, we've all been in the room where it happens. I'm sure we could all share some more stories around incredible conversations. I can think of a couple right now where it was completely not based on any data or performance. And it was just whether someone liked someone. All the time. Yeah. And so all the time, uh, it was a way for me also of embedding um, my values that, that everyone should have access to this. Mm -hmm. um, but it's often stuff that's unspoken. And that's the feedback I've gotten from people is, you know, you've actually nailed the stuff that's unspoken that we just don't talk about that are reasons why people do or don't get promoted. Um, so that was, that was fun. I piloted it with a huge group of clients. I piloted the assessment and then I piloted the guidebook that's coming out. What happened is I did a ton of speaking and coaching last year and on the promotability index and people said they wanted more. <clears throat> They're like, well, what else do you have? And I was like, what do you mean? Just do it. Like, <laughs> like just the stuff that you didn't check, just go, you know, great. Like do it. Yeah. Figure it out. And they're like, no, no, no. And I was like, well, okay, it's a pandemic. I guess I have time to write a book. So that's kind of. Because that's it, an easy thing to do. It takes no time. It's not a lift at all, right? You 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 decided to take on a book in addition to this. It's a guidebook. It's very practical. It's hands-on. It's not, um, you know, it's literally like self-development planning. Because I also realized a lot of people don't have access to, to, great HR, like people like you who are on the call. Some companies are tiny and can't afford it. Or so let's face it, some people have HR that is not um, always doing the right thing or, or they're in a toxic environment and they're being forced to do what some horrible CEO tells them to do, right? We've all had friends or heard stories. Hopefully none of us have had to run screaming from workplaces like that, but I've I've you know seen and, and been peripherally involved in some of them. and. Um, so this is for people who it's giving them, you know, something that they can use. It was the intent and it was, it was a fun process and it's been a fun learning and it's, it's coming out at the end of the month and, and um, we'll see where, we'll see where it goes. Does, does it get into specific tactics within each of the five areas? Like if I need to go bolster my executive presence, yeah. which is, is feedback I got on a performance review early in my career, you need to improve your executive presence. I had no idea what that meant. Oh, uh, right. Yeah. I did not know what I was supposed to go do differently. Um, so does it get into the, the brass tacks of each of those components? Yeah, it does. That, it, that, it, goes, it goes over 35 exercises divided by each of those five elements. It also goes through strengths and obstacles. Mm. Um, it goes, it, it, again, the intent is to come back. You can take the assessment as many times as you want. You know, if you feel like you've improved your, and that's, that's what I've heard too from other people is that they felt good when they took it, which is nice because even as a coach, when I use <laughs> some, some assessments like the Hogan or DISC or Strengths Finder or whatever it is, right? Some people, 360s, whoa, those are the worst, right? People are always crushed when they get a 360 and they turn right to the negative comments and they don't see any of the positive <laughs> stuff. So I was trying to, you know, not create a psychometric assessment that was like that. It was something that was more, the, the, the person owns it. You know, they initiate the discussion. The manager might give it to them or they might sponsor a workshop or something like that, which is great, but it can work from both sides so that it is, um, you know how when, when um, we're in evaluative mode, our creative shuts down. You all have had a lot of wonderful conversations, it sounds like, really fabulous intellectual conversations. So my goal was to try to keep people in the creative while staying in a developmental frame of mind. That's my hope for, for people's experience with the assessment and with the book. I, I love that. I love knowing that that was a design principle of yours when creating it because to your point, I mean, we've all taken a ton of psychometrics and, and we, we have ones that we like and we have ones that we don't like. And, you know, I, uh, I went through an experience with a coworker. Uh, she administered the, the assessment to me. I won't name it, but it rhymes with Instagram and I don't <laughs> like it at all. 
Um, my, kids have been to, my kids have been guessing what type I am. They're like, you're a number something. And I need to do the damn thing apparently, but. <laughs> well, I, I didn't like the results that I got. So it, it you know, and, and not to say that they were incorrect. Mm -hmm. I just didn't like it. And, and I left that experience feeling bummed. Lori knows I, I came to see her afterwards and I was like, I'm a terrible human being. Right? He went, read this. <laughs> Okay, so if we if our goal is to help people change and want to inspire them to get better, an assessment shouldn't leave someone feeling that way, right? Ideally, right. ideally, because then either you're left with as the coach, you're left with, well, let's look at all the good stuff, or hey, at least you don't have a blind spot anymore. I mean, you're kind of left with that, you know, one of those two responses of, mm -hmm. well, at least you know now, and you've got me, and so let's work on it together, and that's and that. It has to happen, like that's part of it. But um, I wanted to add more, right, to the conversation. Um, yeah. so, I, so I hope I hope it's it's been fun to to think about. Yeah, I I, I love it. I dropped a link to it in the in the chat, and people are okay. commenting on it already. Um, I I have it with the chat. Yeah, Ruby said she she said it's a great assessment. She's going to share it with her coaching clients. Morag said it's powerful. David said what a great tool. Morag says Amy should create an online course next. Yeah, Sorry, just Amy. rack it, rack it up, Amy. Twenty twenty two. That's creating online course for PI. <laughs> Mark, I'm not talking about my Instagram. <laughs> uh, so, Amy, th this this notion of promotability, you know, this last year has been hard, um, and you know the concept of owning your own career, taking charge of all that, I, I get that. And, and that was hard in 2019. Mm -hmm. um, what's your advice, especially for sort of mid-career or younger folks doing that in this new, you know, quasi hybrid paradigm that it looks like we're headed for, for the next year or two? It is hard. And I, I did virtual teaching at, at Stanford and UC Berkeley Haas and I did, I had things I was lecturing on and then I had an open Q and A and it was humbling and upsetting to hear how many kids were, you know, with graduating smart kids who had worked so hard were graduating with their jobs had just been rescinded. This was March, literally March of, um, 2020 and, mm -hmm. um, March, April, May. And then my daughter's having a heck of a time, you know, getting getting a summer job as a as just a, a just finishing from home college freshman who never stepped a foot on campus uh, during her college freshman year. So I have tremendous empathy. Um, I would I would say the one silver lining of this, and it happened when I graduated from law school. It was a horrible year to graduate with with student debt, and I had, you know big student debt at the A time. lot of it. It's law school. <laughs> yeah, and it was Georgetown, which was expensive. Um, and so the reality hit, and that's why I went to work for the law firm. Frankly, it was not, I didn't think it was going to be a fit, but I was like, I need money. So, um, so I, and I'm like, this isn't a bad first choice because it's the kind of thing where if you don't do it right away, you never get to do it again. The door closes. Um, so, and, and it wound up being a good bet. And, and I'm glad I did it. And I've made several bets in my career. People thought I was nuts too, by the way, when I quit um, my law firm, didn't know what I was doing, traveled in Asia for a year and did a few odd jobs, one of which was cutting string um, for a um, <laughs> design conference. I got a job as a temp. Um, well, that, and, that should have been in your open, Amy. That's a I'm weird job. To. I'm adding it now. <laughs> I, I was going to, I, I totally meant to, Eric. Um, I thought of that for you. Um, <laughs> And, so um, why were you cutting string? What were you doing? Cutting uh, okay. string? So it was, I was, I was searching the desert for my why, what am I supposed to be doing? You know, and, and HR hadn't quite crystallized yet for me. And I was having a very hard time actually getting an HR job. No one mm. wanted to, to hire an attorney. Okay. You guys will love this. My favorite was I was interviewing for a very, very famous home furnishing store. The name starts with Williams. Um, and a uh, two word name. And I had made it through all the interviews and I was in the final round. I was so excited. I was like, yes, this is fantastic. Um, 
great company to work for. I can cut my teeth in HR. I can, you know, help with investigations, right? I'm a lawyer in California. Like I, I can help prevent issues. And I got to the, the benefits and comp guy who was like a gatekeeper for this role. I learned mm -hmm. later. And I thought I was doing great in the interview. I was, you know, sharing, I was saying, you know, I do this, I do nonprofit work. I'm chair of a board. Um, I've, I've been an employment lawyer. Like, you know, he just, he just put his pencil down at one point in the interview and he just said, you know, for this job, you need to be able to get along with people. <laughs> and you're a lawyer. And, mm. and I was, right, <laughs> and I was like, oh my God, quickly in my mind, I'm like, did I do anything that was like, rude or like not nice or something in this interview or and i'm like oh my god it's because i'm a litigator and he can't get past the law degree i am screwed and right I just, <laughs> I just thought wow and i really had to hustle and so that period reminds me of what i think kids are going to go through now i wound up um talking to them a ton of that experience made me realize oh i'm going to get no credit for what I've done. Like I'm starting over mm -hmm. and I need to be really humble about this. And I need to um, just start at the ground level and, and really start talking to other HR people. I took the SHRM exam um, to show that I was serious about being an HR right. person, yeah. literally. And it's interesting how the universe works, Eric. I had passed the exam, but hadn't like gotten the credential and I, but I got my job offer that was my lucky break into HR at an environmental consulting company, Tetra Tech. Some of you might know. Um, oh, yeah. I became the HRBP for the San Francisco office for 150 people, and it was a, an amazing break. And, but I literally had to negotiate with them. I said, look, I know I don't have the experience ideally for this job, but I'm overqualified in some weird ways. And I said, I've looked at your policies. I've looked at your handbook. Your, your maternity leave, your, your leave of absence disability policies are way out of date. This was like, you know, 20 years ago. And um, I will do, I know you can't, they were government contractors. So they only made 10% <laughs> on the margin. They were super fun cleanup company. I said, I will update. If you give me this chance, I will like do all of your employment law stuff um, as a part of my job and bring you up to date on all that. And that's how I got my first HR job. You, oh, you volunteered to do all the... Yeah. That was a great the sales pitch, man. Cause everybody in HR is like, oh my God, yes, please come do yeah. that. <laughs> Cause they don't want to do that. That's all the crap work. <laughs> and, and I was, so I was doing that and I, I was analyzing all the, the, the law, you know, right up to, and, and I was filling out benefit paper benefit forms for people who were too damn lazy to do it. Right. So I had like this, you know, it was, and, and I outgrew the job after a couple of years. And I, then I got a call from a recruiter to be the dedicated HRBP for the general counsel's office at Fireman's Fund. That was when things, then I, then I, after three years, I got promoted to corporate HR and I was the head of workplace policies and procedures. And then I had to lead a major riff and change severance benefits and, and do an employee handbook and then do whistleblower helpline when SOX came out. And then I moved back to legal, which I thought I'd left forever. <laughs> so so I, I tell this story because like, and I've pivoted several times if you, if you look at my um, resume. And so that's why I also felt comfortable creating the promotability index because um, I, I, I just think if you think about it the right way and you do have to um, hopefully have some money in the bank and different people have to make decisions on what they're comfortable with and their degree of risk. But ultimately it's eventually paid off for me. You know, there's always some, sh some short term stuff that maybe you do that work that you don't like, or I've also stayed at jobs when I needed to just, you know, be the breadwinner. Yeah and earn the money and raising two kids. And I, I've, I've done that too. And that there are great reasons to do that. And I always tell people that as well, but there are also sometimes great reasons to leave and make a leap and, yeah. and knowing the difference and thinking about that and having trusted advisors to work through that is so important. So it makes me, it, Amy, it makes me think about um, kind of my personal journey in comparison to, to some of what you shared. Um, I spent 18 years in the same organization. And when I say that, I'm always like, that's a whole person who can drink time span, <laughs> right? Or who can vote. That's that's right. Who can vote. So they, they um, could drink in the 70s. It's well, you know, back in the day. <laughs> well, I was 12 when I started there, clearly. So uh, but but you know, in that in that kind of career path, I started early career and 
was able to develop skills and change opportunities and do things. It was all in human resources, but it was within the same organization. And it wasn't a huge organization. Um, but what I also realized after all of that time is I was like, maybe too long in one place, right? I think there might have been some some missed opportunities here. And, and I realized that when I was getting my, my master's degree. And then I was like networked with all of these people that were from all kinds of different organizations. And I was just like, Whoa, what are you guys doing out there? Like I, I kind of missed the whole, as part of my career growth, I missed the networking piece. And I kind of, I felt like I kind of got institutionalized, you know? And so, and, and, you know, everything works out the way it should. And I, I actually, when I decided to leave, I took a, a, um, hierarchical, I took a lower level position. I took a pay cut because I wanted to focus specifically on the stuff I was passionate about. And there are great so reasons myself, to do that. Absolutely. Right. I'd worked myself up into a role that was, was higher in the organizational chart, but I was still doing a bunch of crap that I was just like so tired of. And so when I left, I'm like, I'll take a pay cut in order to focus on this space. And so, you know, I'm just curious with, with this whole promotability piece and, and changing employers can be a really good thing. It can also be seen as a lack of loyalty or job hopping, or I still hear people talk about that, which is kind of baffling. Really? These days. Oh yeah. Well, they've only been at their jobs for two years at a time. I'm like, and? Certain companies are like that. So I, one of the companies where I was an executive was McKesson and boy, they yeah. would uh, punish you, you know, like yeah. you wouldn't make it past the, the TA desk, you know, yeah. your resume. If you had been a job jumper, it had to be like three years, which will be fascinating for the next generation, right? Yeah. Luckily, luckily in healthcare, people do tend to, unless it's biotech, they jump around a lot, but um, but there are reasons for that. R and D, you know, if fun, you can kind of explain some of that. But but um, distribution or some of the the hardcore um, operations type um, HR and the financial services, they're gonna they're gonna check you out. Most of my work has been in highly regulated industries like financial services, and although I have done some fun stuff like, um, you know, some Hollywood stuff and other other random uh, Silicon Valley companies. But yeah. yeah, to your point, Lori, it it will be interesting because again, the next gen is thinking one and a half to three years, and they expect that promotion or that title change regularly. And I also tried to address that in a in a indirect nice way in the promotability index and in the article I wrote for HBR, because I ran into it myself as a, as a boss, when I was building a team, I had a very difficult employee that I needed to manage. who was a rock star. She was phenomenal. And she was expecting like a promotion every year and a half. And yeah. it, made, it made for a very, um, unpleasant conversation every year. Cause she was yeah. with the wrong company to do that. McKesson was not going to do that. You know, and um, it's 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 interesting when you have to uh, you know do that, and then of yeah. course managing you know salary and bonuses and hitting pay grade maximums and all that stuff. So yeah, because it's it's so hard to talk. Sometimes you feel like you're talking out of both sides of your mouth. Like we're all about right. professional development, and giving you opportunities, and hell no, we can't keep promoting you. What are you crazy? We're only two. <laughs> so you know, it's like trying trying to balance those expectations of wanting to get people to advocate for their own development and, and getting leadership to provide those opportunities with the reality check of everybody can't be a VP in the organization. Exactly. And we can't just, we're not all, we're not all banks or law firms, Lori. <laughs> exactly. Right. And we can't just create roles for you because you're super passionate about this particular area that doesn't meet the needs of the business. Right. And you're and trying I had to have some, some, I've had some, I've taken the bullet on some of my Q and a calls, Lori, with that. I've done a lot of um, calls for leadership groups, often, you know, women's groups where people feel safe saying stuff because there's no one from the same employer yeah. on there. Right. right? And, and they know each other like leadership, California and professional business women's such as California and how women lead some of the other ones. And um, people will say, well, I'm not getting promoted and, you know, blah, blah, blah. And, and, and I'll just say, you know, at a certain point, like have that conversation with your boss because you you may top out and there can there there are only so many positions at the top right. and yeah. and you if that's really important to you then you may have to leave at some point 
Right. You get that. Like I do see, and I, what I hear you saying, and I think it's true. Some people just, it's amazing. Some employees just sit there and they're banging their head against the wall virtually. Mm-hmm. And the manager is like, Oh, I don't want to have this conversation again. And, right. and, and they really should just sit down and just be like, look, mm-hmm. you will probably never get a job title change at this company ever again. There are nicer ways to say that, <laughs> but that's basically <laughs> what you'd be saying in yeah. so many words. And, and, and you just kind of got to call it. I, th- I think that's more authentic than like pretending, but I don't think we always equip our managers to have those conversations because those aren't fun and no one really wants to say it. No one wants to say you've reached the end of the line, bud. you know, at age 40 or whatever it is, you know, and, and but- I, I think there's still a hesitation in leadership where it's like they, they, they take on a perspective of, I hesitate developing people because they're going to get dissatisfied and leave. And I, I always flip that around. That is hard. Like, well, what if yeah. you don't? What if you don't develop anybody in the house? They stay. stay. Right. <laughs> or how angry are they going to be with you if it's fi- like they they don't? Um, it doesn't get better. This this is my philosophy now. Like you know, tw- over time, I just thought you know we do need to have these conversations because what I started to see, and maybe a lot of you on the call have seen this, is if someone really, really, really wants that promotion, they're not getting it they're gonna hit a, a curve where they start to feel resentful. Yep. If someone is not being truthful and authentic with them, and to David's point earlier about, let's have these authentic relationships, let's have the tough conversations in a kind, you know, kind, clear, fair, and firm are my four principles for good leadership. Be kind, be fair, but be clear and be firm, right? Yeah. So if it's clear that the person is not going to be promoted, Ideally, you have the vocabulary to tell them why, mm-hmm. whether it's because the company's shrinking, nothing to do with them, right? The market, um, whatever it is, or you know, they are amazing at their job and you need them to do that job and there's no other job to be had. Mm-hmm. I, get, I get that from um, you know, people who want to be a general counsel and they're, they're kind of you know, or they want to manage people. And it, there's only one legal job in the company because it's, because it's right. small. And I'm like, you know, you've got to start thinking strategically, mm-hmm. <laughs> like take a, like get a 50,000 foot view, read your 10 K. Like, where are you growing? Like, are you publicly traded? Are, are you growing? What are trends in your market? What are your competitors doing? Like you should know all that stuff. If, if you want to be thinking about where you need to be, I love the Wayne Gretzky quote, you know, I always want to be where the, I always want to skate towards where the hockey puck is going to be. I think about that with careers. Mm -hmm. And that's to your earlier question about what should young people be thinking about? If they can't make money, I mean, if they can't get a job right now, they can be doing other things. Mm -hmm. They can, you know, I just had a conversation literally upstairs with my daughter around, does she go waitress this summer? Mm -hmm. Or does she take um, a, a data analyst job intern for free. And luckily, because she did pay jobs the last two summers, I said, you know, you've earned the right to work for free this summer. And I felt so good about that. I was like, thank God. Like I've been, I wish I'd had this coaching. Not that I'm (laughs) much in the world, but like, you know, yeah. My mom was a stay at home mom and that, that was um, very different. And my dad worked all the time and then played golf. And I grew up in a very traditional actually Southern uh, household. The parents were from Texas, even though I grew up in Connecticut. And so I didn't get a lot of this support. So I would tell you the other personal motivation and reason that I created the PI is because it's the stuff I wish I'd known all the way up. Mm-hmm. Um, and I was lucky. I had some amazing male and female mentors um, on the way up, um, but not always, you know? And so it would have been nice. Yeah. I, I love it. I love, I love all of your experience and it's so relevant to what we talk about here on the reg. Mm-hmm. So seriously, you should join the network and you should come back <laughs> as often as you want. Um, I want to, I, I want to flip it to questions. Um, Mark, Mark had a question in the chat, Mark, I'm just going to pull you in here. Um, if you want to ask that question out loud. Sure, put me on the spot, but uh, thank you, Amy, for sharing uh, all these stories. But right now, uh, I'm working with a client, and one of the issues was it was an internal promotion. 
And from the group, they didn't do an, a formal interview process. And then working with the VP, and now I'm working with the directors who didn't get the role, trying to explain to them that, you know, you're always kind of interviewing. It's your total body of work. It's not a formal interview because it's been formally posted. Some things have occurred over the last three weeks and it was bang, 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 uh, you know, from that perspective. So am I on the right path or am I, you know, maybe on a slippery slope by telling people just because there wasn't a formal interview process, realize that you're always interviewing in the eyes of senior leadership. Oh, Amy, you're muted. Sorry, I was trying to be polite. Um, yeah, you're always on. And Mark, you're totally right. Um, that is the pressure of the mantle of leadership is that you are always on. I'll, I, I loved my years as an executive and the burden is real. It, it's extreme. The pressure of being a Fortune 5 executive was exceptional, especially being responsible for legal and regulatory compliance for a, a drug distribution company when the opioid epidemic was um, beginning yes. to turn the corner. So I, I can tell you, yeah. Um, and everything you say and do can be interpreted as the company mm -hmm. as well. And you have to watch conflicts of interest. There are certain activities that I was involved in very privately that I really had to keep on the down low in terms of some of, some of my nonprofit work that I didn't think that my very conservative company um, frankly, as, a, as, as someone who's really a social justice advocate, um, that I, I needed to be respectful um, of that. And um, I'm grateful not to have that gag order now, which enables me to write freely about things like pay equality and, and, and um, testify for the Women on Boards bill, which I would not have been able to do working for probably any, any company that I've ever worked for. Um, cause they wouldn't have taken a position, Eric, you know, and I worked for some pretty traditional, you know, old companies. Um, so, but no, Mark, I, I think that's what makes, I think you've also hit on the hard thing about getting promoted internally, right? I bet one trend you also would all agree with me on is that, gosh, it's, it's so the outside advantage, right? Oh, yeah. That basically that, that to me, that's what you're talking about too, is that one thing happens, you know, with the CEO sees one incident or hears about one that, that happened in a, in a succession planning. Um, and that actually was one of the reasons why I, uh, I decided it wasn't a good culture fit, but there was a stray remark by the CEO about someone during succession planning, during bonuses. And that completely, because this particular CEO was um, scary to everyone mm -hmm. on, on his executive team, they immediately just changed it. Like yeah. all the data and the the um, sponsorship that the that the particular executive had given, saying, "Oh, this person's done this, this, this. They achieved this. They're on track for this." And then there was this moment where the the CEO sits back and says, "Yeah, you know, I've heard that, or <laughs> I had this experience when, or at that Christmas party two years ago, mm -hmm. you know." And boom, the the guy was just cut off the knee out. Um, and it's human nature and it, it's, it's, um, something we need to watch out for, right? It's why inherent bias exists. It's so, yeah, yeah that's again, why going back to the data, back to the objective criteria, I think you gave very good advice, unfortunately, you know, Mark. Yeah. So I hope that's helpful. David, you had a, you had a comment and a question around the kind, clear, fair, and firm. Do you want to? bring that into the conversation here for Amy? Yeah, yeah thanks. Um, Amy, I, I really love your perspectives. They resonate with me. So thanks for um, uh, joining us. I especially love the kind, clear, fair firm. I think I got it right. Is that right? Kind, mm -hmm. clear, yeah. fair firm. And as I was reflecting on it for a moment, I was thinking, well, I love this. I also find that consistency plays a role. In other words, mm -hmm. if there's a consistent, balanced, uh, positive dialogue that's going on between manager and employee, then uh, it will be uh, tough feedback can be managed in the moment much more easily as opposed to being stored up two or three months later. And, and then they're kind, clear, fair, and firm, but they're um, 
delivering a message that could have been delivered one or two or three months ago, if you said, you know what you did in that meeting two months ago, two months ago, <laughs> what was that meeting? That's, I, I, yeah. So uh, I, I just thought I'd throw out this notion of consistency ensures yeah. the likelihood of a uh, positive response. Does that make sense? It, it does, absolutely. I, I, think um, that, I think consistency, you know, not having consistency really throws people off and it doesn't, doesn't inspire trust. Mm-hmm. You, you need that consistency also just to, people need to, to know, you know, who you are. And I, I know one piece of advice that is an old truism that some people might think is outdated, but I actually still think is true is that um, some of the best advice I got to is, you know, choose, choose the face that you want to have as an executive, because people will be looking to you to know what your set point is. And, and because the leader brings the weather. And so, mm. Nice. And so if you are always kind of anxious and stuff, you know, great, then, then like do that. And then people will be like, oh, that's, you know, she just runs kind of anxious versus, you know, you know, stoic. And then like, because that really impacts people as well. So, so consistency in so many levels, I think is important as, as a leader, people yeah. want, kids do it with parents, right? They want to know, oh, like, do I have stability? Do I have someone I can trust. I, I'm, I was a part of a white paper project for the Harvard Institute of Coaching that hasn't come out yet. Please remind me, it should be available pretty soon and I can share that with you. We interviewed um, CEOs and other clients last summer around the pandemic and the impact on leadership and how, what was showing up. How did the pandemic change people's priorities? What shifts did they make personally in their leadership style to try to be a better leader? And then and what was coming up for them? And those interviews were really fascinating. And what um, the, the positive sides were that leaders were really queuing into their empathy a lot more mm-hmm. because of the shared experience of the pandemic. Um, and also that they were, um, they were, one challenge was that they were finding where's the boundary between being the heroic leader that always has the answer mm-hmm. um, and the empathetic human being behind the Zoom screen with kids running around with you know, an apartment in Hong Kong, you know, being, I have one friend that's always out on her ledge because she has three kids and, you know, had to get a Zoom background to try to look professional because there's no space at home in a Hong Kong apartment to have a work office, you know, fill in the blank, right? Everybody had their thing that was difficult. Um, so that'll, that's really interesting to me as well in terms of you know, what it, what's it, I'm curious and would love your thoughts, actually, if I can ask you guys a question um, on what you think, you know, will this experience have changed the ability of leaders to be more real? Or are we still going to hold them to the same, I'll, I'll call it for lack of a better word, heroic type standard. Um, I'm, I'm very curious about that because being a leader is really challenging, right? It's so easy to criticize when you're not in the ring. It's a great question. And we actually had Lurie's boss on the show a couple of weeks ago. And yeah, I mean, that guy is, he's, he's about as authentic as they get as leaders go. And that moving bar through all of the quagmire that was 2020, mm-hmm. uh, dude is an example of how to do it right. Right. Yeah. I think it, I, well, and I think that matters to your question who who is the highest level setter <laughs> and how are, how are they showing up because that they bring the weather i love how yeah, you said that, I love right? that. Because, if, because if they revert back to a you know a more staunch less empathetic kind of persona then that sort of you know subconsciously becomes i guess that's what we're supposed to do you know you're bringing up another good point that always comes up in my compliance circles but, I, but you all appreciate it as well as um when I, you know, you start to do all the ethics training and I still speak and and help compliance officers feel the strength to do their jobs, which are, are, there's so many similarities for me in in all of the governance roles, the gatekeeping roles. There's a lot of pressure on on each one of you on this call, I would imagine as well. 
And I think of um, ethics as well. There's been a lot of temptation to cut corners, mm -hmm. um, to, to save jobs. You, you had a lot of really good excuses this year to, to break the right. law, frankly. Yeah. Um, and uh, there's huge you know, concerns about what's going to happen when the tide goes out. And we see you know, who was swimming naked, to quote <laughs> Warren Buffett, in terms, of, um, in terms of ethics and compliance. And it's starting to show up like the fraud capability went through the roof, data privacy concerns with companies not being prepared to suddenly have a remote workforce, right. you know, right. with private documents, private, you know, VPNs, whatever. Um, and I always think of ethics as well as, as, as kind of, I, I pictured it in my mind as like, you know, the game limbo where you, you've got a bar and you have to kind of go under the, the bar. To me, the, the leader also sets the bar for conduct. And in my experience, um, employees will look to see by word and deed where their boss, their direct boss, who controls their compensation and their promotability, right. sets that bar and they can go under it. Whatever it is, if it's here, that means, okay, well, I'm not the big person. I can right. go here and I'm okay because they're getting paid the big bucks and they got the title. You know, it's never, oh, I'm going to do, <laughs> it's rarely, right? And, um, trying to share that with leaders so that they understand that as well. Hope, you know, luckily if you have great leaders, they get that and they know that and they see that, but unfortunately some don't. And those are the ones that I usually podcast about that are <laughs> like, like, like we work and Goldman Sachs last year and, you know, like, um, uh, Nissan. We, yeah. yeah. We had a uh, Sydney Finkelstein on Finkelstein on, and he wrote um, why, uh, what's it called? Why executives fail? Why, why smart executives fail? And it was sort of the yeah. autopsies on the big crashing <laughs> stories. Yeah. Of, of we could have a whole other show on that. That'd be fun. Yeah. Well, that's that's what I was gonna say. It sounds like we're gonna need an Amy part two. You guys think <laughs> yeah. so? Yes. Yeah. Absolutely. Right, Amy, thank you so much. Let's all give Amy a big ups. <laughs> big big ups. Thank you so much, Amy. And yeah, let's definitely get a part two because I want to get deeper into that uh, women's pay equity yeah. issue. Um, it's a thing that we talk about here. Um, I'm curious about the women on boards idea too. That Yeah, still kind of flabbergasted that we had to have a law about that in 2020. Yeah. It seems weird to me. Well, at least we're, uh, we're doing better. We're, um, we're at like 22% in, in California. We were at, at uh, you know, 18%. So it did, it did move companies and, and frankly, the best companies were starting to do it thanks to the pressure from institutional investors, but it was kind of a one, two punch having, yeah. Bla having Larry Fink from BlackRock send a letter two years ago to um, some of the largest publicly traded companies in the world saying, Hey, just want to give you two years to figure this out. We've looked at your, <laughs> we've looked at your board because it takes a while in fairness, it takes a while to do diligence. I've done board succession planning and I've been, you know, nominating and comp. A board, you know, liaison as a CHRO and all that. And some of you probably have as well. So you get it. And they said, we're, if you don't have any women on your board in two years and you, and you know, we need a written plan as to how you plan to achieve that. Um, and, or, you know, we will start divesting. Mm -hmm. um, so that was super helpful <laughs> as well, as you can imagine. Yeah. Um, and then I think just the next generation asking and looking and the tie between the, the comp composition of the executive team and the board. We, we know now there's a correlation between uh, the number of women on the executive team, interestingly, listen to this, and the number of women on the board, not the reverse. Hmm. So the more women that are on the organization's executive team, the more board members. And, and I personally believe that's because they're in the room saying to the CEO, hey, you know, we don't have any women on this, this board. And very often, possibly that's the CHRO or the CFO or CMO. And that's, that's super helpful. Yeah. Wow. wow. Awesome. All right. This has been so much fun. All let's right. do I'll our, you guys. <laughs> yeah, no, we could go all night. Um, let's do our funny things, our good feel stories and uh, our cocktail and get everybody out to dinner. Uh, thanks again, Amy. So much fun. This has been a blast. Funny thing. Number one, April, 2020 working from home sucks. April, 2021. If we have to go back to the office full time, I will quit. <laughs> That's funny. funny thing number two, animals taking selfies. I just love the look on the cat's face, really. <laughs> <laughs> number three, today I saw the impossible. And this is actually a video of a seagull riding a seagull in flight. <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah, this one made me laugh. Uh, being being a guitar player, jazz musician explaining a chord or computer generating a password. <laughs> That's an F sharp seven flat nine slash D flat chord, which is really hard to play or a really really good password. <laughs> <laughs> This one back on the animal front just made me laugh. Go ahead, Twitter. Do your thing. Oh, <laughs> lost cat. <Aww>. <laughs> Staying on that on that theme here. Finally, someplace I can take my croissant Bernard, the large bread <laughs> dog park. <laughs> oh, and my favorite funny thing from yesterday uh, <laughs> from Russell Brand. I always feel like I'm flying the Millennium Falcon when we sit like this. <laughs> I love him. Oh, that's really funny. <laughs> These are great, Eric. <laughs> Today's good feel story. This is a local for us Denver people. This is the COVID bandit up at Flagstaff House. He mm. left a $5,600 tip for the staff this week. Wow. This is kind of in theme with with what what this person's been doing uh over the the past year it's pretty pretty awesome stuff today's semi-quarantine semi-quarantine cocktail is the french belgian border did you guys hear about this farmer got annoyed and moved a rock so this is a riff on the grilled grapefruit paloma which i can't Mm -hmm. wait to make because Lori Mm -hmm. will love this Mm -hmm. you're gonna you're going to need two limes, one nuisance stone, <laughs> a little bit of white sugar. The stone was originally placed in 1819 and has the date actually stamped on the bottom of it. Uh, you're going to need a red grapefruit halved widthwise. Uh, the farmer chucked that stone seven and a half feet, a little bit of kosher salt. That created an accidental land grab of a thousand meters for Belgium. A <laughs> little bit of ice cubes. Humanity reigns here, a uh, little bit of tequila. The government just laughed and move it back. <laughs> Everybody wins. France isn't smaller. A little bit of club soda. Grill those fruits. Make that drink. You guys have a wonderful evening. <laughs> Wednesdays are my favorite days, and you're my favorite people. Love each and every one of you. We'll see you next week. Amy, thank you so much. We got to get a, a part two on the books. I'm, I can't wait. Looking forward to it. Thanks, guys. Take care, Good night. Everyone. Bye. Thank you so much for joining us today. If you had a good time and learned a thing or two at today's happy hour, please share it with your friends. If you want to join our tribe, head on over to skyteam.cloud forward slash TCB or email us at info at skyteam.com. That's S-K-Y-E team dot com. Thanks again, and remember, you've always got friends at the Corporate Bartender.